walking down the corridor towards the back door, and I walked past my parents' bedroom. The door is a little open. And they're talking. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have, but I, I listened a little. And Papa's saying, you know, Alka, I'm a little concerned. I sort of hate to, but I'm sort of putting two and two together. I forgot to mention, that morning, Saturday morning, when I got up, I walked over, and I smelled some <laughs> cooking. And I walked over to the stove, and my mother grabbed me. Don't touch the stove! I said to her, Why? Well, well, what's the problem with the stove? The stove is cold on Saturday mornings. Nevertheless, you should not get into the habit of touching the stove. Mm -hmm. And she hugged me to, and held my hand. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know why, but I sort of forgot about it. But that night, my father's saying to her, you know, there are several things that I'm putting together. Like, why were you concerned about Henry potentially touching the stove on Saturday morning. There's no cooking on Saturday. And now as I think back of it, Friday night, I heard these sounds in the kitchen. Well, the kids were all asleep. I figured it was you. And you gave a <gasps> sound. And then, after a while, I heard you moving around, so I figured, I guess you stubbed your toe or something or other. And mm. You were feeling a little better, and then it became quiet, so I guess you went back. Well, it puzzled me. And then, when we were coming back from the synagogue, I don't know if the children noticed it, but I saw you walking with two baskets. Why would you be out of the house with baskets? And why was the stove, I assume, warm? Otherwise, you wouldn't have grabbed them like that. And why did I smell cooking on Saturday morning? I hate to think it, but you know, there's some sort of violation mm. that's taking place, and I hate to believe it. Well, you must understand, now you must understand, you must help me. Help you what? Well, you see what happened is Friday night, I was standing at the kitchen window for a reason. I had noticed that some wood seems to be disappearing from our pile. I was curious as to how come it was disappearing. And as I looked out, there was our neighbor, the widow Schwartz, taking a couple of logs from our pile. I felt terrible about it. And then I thought about it. You know, she's a widow. She has three young children. So I decided to do the following. Saturday morning, I went to a house while you and the boys were at the synagogue, and I carried two baskets with me filled with food. I told her that we had invited 12 relatives for Sabbath dinner, and at the last minute, they told us they're not coming, and we have all this food. Oh, am I going to have a sin on my head? All that food wasted. She should do a mitzvah for me. She should take the food, please, for she and her daughters, so that I would not have the guilt of having wasted good food. But you know, I looked at her house, it was terrible. Bare walls, two broken beds for a mother and three daughters. He says, look, Alka, I don't mind this. Would being gone, I would have given her gladly 10 times as much. He says, and yes, and this is what you're gonna do from now on. Every night, quietly, in the middle of the night, you're going to bring a couple of logs and throw it on her bunch. Make sure you're not seen. So of course, I'll gladly do it. Yep, but there's something more. You have the f a friend, the widower, Rozovsky. He's a widower. His children are all grown. They're married off. It's no life for a man to live alone. It's time he took on family responsibilities. So I'll tell you what. We're going to invite him and the widow and her three children to, shop, to Saturday midday they meal, and who knows, maybe we'll solve all their problems at one time. And so the story of my Sabbath in Minsk comes to a close. But 
my daughter is going to have children with God's help. And I picture in my mind that one of them will be named Stephanie. And I will tell her the story of our Sabbath in Minsk. And she will relate it to her husband, who will record my story in the other guests' chronicles of a people, so the world will know what a Jewish Sabbath is and should be. Thank you. Now, why was she cooking on the Shabbat? She was cooking to prepare all that food when she discovered that the widow is taking logs and there's no one to support her. Okay. Then she has to do a mitzvah. She has to give her something, some food. But obviously that's going to be a one-shot deal. Okay. Now, even if you give her food for 12, it's not going to last for the re next seven years. So she's cooking. She's violating the Sabbath law so she can cook all that food when she's discovered that the poor widow has taken this. She knows that she's short of food and everything else, so she has to do that. And the husband, incidentally, said, I forgive you. I'm sure God will forgive you because you were doing a mitzvah. Well, it was like a pekuach, pekuach nefesh, yeah. where their lives were in danger. So Yeah, for lack of food. Lack of food. Lack of food. So the, uh, it's, a law, it's a law to live by, not to die by. by. Right. And he... Uh, and the husband is to now get his friend Rizovsky to meet with her so that we can solve all their problems. He's a successful businessman. He earns a living. His children are all happily married off. And he's still vital. And she's certainly presumably vital. And she's got three daughters. So they married? She, yeah. So they married. Mazel tov. <laughs> 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 You've been watching Rabbi Rock. We've been speaking and hearing from Dr. Herbert Osadol. Thank you so much. Shalom and bracha. Shalom and blessings to you all. Okay.